You are listening to Abyss Gazing, a horror podcast where we celebrate all things spooky and mental health. My name is Mark, and I'm your co-host. And I am Josh, and I am your other co-host. And we brought back Billy from the Crimes Against the Future episode. Hey guys, Crimes how you doing? Of the future. Whatever. <laughs> get Close it right, enough. Mark. Get it right. <laughs> Close enough. I, I get Cronenberg has two movies with the same titles, but he's still a still revered uh, director. So we have to at least respect him. I mean, that at least one of still, us has to. That movie still hurts me to this day. So I'm going to yeah. buy you that as your going away present. When you guys decide to leave Virginia, I'm just going to be like, here you go, Mark. Can I get you like the special edition, like Blu-ray with, oh, I'm going to get like a, <laughs> Could call all out. I'll get him the popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we're going to talk about Nope today because it's freaking awesome. Nope. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's so hard to not talk about this movie and not make puns about it. Uh, so I have already shared my, my thoughts on this spoiler free. You guys can go check them out. It's youtube.com forward slash victims and villains or victims and villains.net forward slash reviews. Uh, but Bill being our guest, what are your general thoughts on this movie? Just kind of coming out of it. I can, I like the movie, honestly. Um, like you said, it, it has a lot relatable things like that. Um, I don't want to give it away any spoilers, um yet i did yet but it did it did uh i gave mark a comparison of a movie i'm not going to say it right now because that would kind of be a huge spoiler for it but if you go into this movie i can't see how somebody would dislike it uh it's got comedy it's got suspense it's actually got pretty much everything you would look for in a movie to me yeah it it was just uh, so what was it? Get Out was the first um, yeah. movie that he did. It was okay. Um, Us was better. I, I enjoyed Us a little better. <laughs> um, but this one, I, I, out of the movies he's done so far, I think this might be my favorite. And mainly because I like, like alien stuff and weird crap like that. And this feels like an old school, a modern version of an old school 50s like UFO or big monster, big monster. If I, if I was not producing this, this podcast right now, I would have walked off. Get Out <laughs> is amazing. It was, uh, it was OK. All right. So so <laughs> let me let me clarify this. I, I like each one of his, Jordan Peele's movies for different reasons. I think Get Out served as a really great, modern, timeless and timely social commentary that is like body horror that feels really unique. But I liked Us for, uh, I think Us has a stronger rewatchability for it. And then you have Nope. And Nope, I, I, I think you... Awesome. Nope is absolutely epic. Like, I, I just want to say that like this, out of all three that he's done, this might be my favorite. And Mark, I think you're absolutely right. This feels so nostalgic. Like it feels like it's, yes, you have a lot of modern sensibilities that make the movie feel modern, but the way that the story is told, it feels like something that you would go to a drive-in and see. They don't make alien movies like this nowadays. Yeah, it just like I said, it feels like a modern old school um alien invasion or big monster movie from like the the 50s yeah i, I agree with you 100 percent um so i mean i'm not saying it's aliens but it's aliens I mean, <laughs> it's it's really hard to like not talk about aliens in like the spoiler free because like the trailer like when i loaded up the movie like on my regal cinemas app because that's where i saw it and the the like the still frame for the movie is the ufo yeah I get so it. it's I get not it. like they're like trying to hide that this is like aliens and in, in jordan peele's note but it's like i couldn't also, resist I feel, the joke though yeah yeah i yeah. feel like 
I, I feel like less is more, and this movie does less is more so incredibly well. So the fact that they're using stuff like aliens or like flying saucers or stuff like that for uh, in the trailers, like it just kind of seems like such a it saddens me a, a little bit because I feel like it kind of gives away the big twist of this movie. Yeah, but it doesn't. That's the thing. Is it, it it does to an extent, but it doesn't once they make the reveal of what they're actually dealing with. I agree 100 percent, but I'm worried that we're going to get into spoilers here shortly if you keep on. <laughs> All right. All right. This is your official spoiler warning. If you guys haven't seen Jordan Peele's Nope, it's now playing as of this podcast is now playing in theaters everywhere. Go check it out. Hit pause. Come back. Subscribe to this podcast and uh, come back and share your thoughts. With nope on us. Um, so I, first, first of ahead. all, one of the first things I had seen was some early, I, I guess, reviews or previews or whatever. And they all said that this movie should be seen in IMAX instead of a regular theater. So I went to get tickets for me and Billy and one of our other friends. And the regular theater was pretty much sold out. If we had gotten tickets, we were going to be sitting in front of the screen like right up under it, breaking our necks to watch it. So I was like, you know what? It's only like a dollar more. We ended up getting IMAX tickets. And some of the scenes involving the UFO flying around or coming out of nowhere were just, uh, I think the IMAX just made it friggin' epic as hell. I agree. I mean, I, I can't imagine watching a regular screen for some of the reveals when they showed the ship or the, or the UFO at the end and everything like that, that, I can't see a regular screen doing what that IMAX did. No, I I had never actually considered seeing this movie in IMAX. I had actually gotten tickets when I pre-ordered him uh, for a regular screen. And then I was talking to Mark and he was like, yeah, I got my tickets in IMAX. And I was like, I, I guess I should like, like go and get IMAX. So I went and like exchanged, canceled my original tickets, got IMAX and the IMAX experience is something that's really immersive for this one. I've seen in the last year, I've seen uh, Spider-Man, I've seen Batman and both in IMAX and like both of those movies were like, okay to see an IMAX. Like I feel like I suffer from superhero fatigue from time to time, but seeing nope in there this might be the best theatrical experience i've had all year and could end up having all year because like like you're right uh, uh bill like just the the reveal of like the ship and just like the epic scope of this movie especially the climax and the way that like peel like framed like certain scenes like the scene where kiki palmer's character is like riding on the motorcycle through the field and like just the way that it like oh, yeah. twists and turns with the camera like it's so magnificently shot and just kind of getting like the epic scene at the end with them trying to capture like I, I couldn't imagine that seeing that on a regular screen and it's gonna make me so sad when I watch this like at, at home, home after yeah. it comes up blu-ray I'm just like it doesn't compare well, I mean, I got to see Interstellar both on a regular screen in the theater and on an IMAX, a six-story IMAX at um, the Hampton Air and Space Museum. And it was like night and day difference. And I think this would have been kind of the same thing for some of the scenes it has. Uh, I saw Dark Knight Rises in um, IMAX and regular theater and some of the scenes you don't really notice it at first, but there's some of the scenes that cut to a different aspect that were designed for IMAX. And those scenes were just so much more epic in an IMAX theater. And, and no falls right in there because of the way the scenes are shot for the UFO flying around and kind of seeing it sneak around through the clouds like it's a tiger or something hunting through bushes and stalking a prey. Uh, it just it made it that much more fun to see. And I, I love the television scene where they were on the recording studio and things like that. I think that actually helped there also from the point of view of the kid where you could see everything and, and you could see Gordy. And yes, Mark, I jumped when they shot Gordy. <laughs> but uh, 
when they <laughs> when they when they <laughs> did Gordy, I I man, I was immersed in the in in it at that point because I was following along with the story. I knew the fist bump was coming, and all you heard was boom. So like, no, no, I, I was right there with you, man. Like I, I got like really immersed into that scene and you get like really close to the fist bump and then it's just a bam and it just down goes Gordy. Like uh, I, I was right there with you. There was a couple of like moments in this movie that the jump scares got me just because of like how like immersed into this world you are. Um, and- what? I, I was really surprised because I hadn't seen him in anything in years. I think he's done some smaller stuff and stage shows, but Michael Wincott was in it. He was the cameraman that came in at the end. He was also the main bad guy in the original Crow and was <laughs> one of the main bad guys wow. in Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Michael Wincott has one of the most distinctive voices in acting ever. You hear his voice, you know who it is. Wow. So it was, okay. It, it was kind of cool to see him in that. He did such an awesome job in The Crow. So, well, and I love the fact of how he went into it at the end, um, where he was like, no, no, I still got to get this money shot. That's what a guy would do in real life. It's not. Like something, oh, he wrote this. Somebody wrote this in, and they're just trying to get the storyline across. Well, That's likely insane person. Maybe. Yeah, but <laughs> I mean, you, you're talking about a television studio guy. That's like, I want to be remembered. That's what they're going to do. They're going to do. They're going to try to get that shot, no matter what it takes. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I, you know, they've made a lot of movies about that, but like from someone that used to be like really like just had no life and like was actually like like obsessed with like celebrity affairs like dude yeah like the paparazzi like knows no bounds so like especially like someone of his craft because like every shot up until like he actually meets up with the three main characters is just him and in, in the editing bay and he's just always constantly like never satisfied with his craft until like he gets the 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 news call and then he's like oh you know what i'm actually gonna go out here and and get this money shot like that would 100 percent be that character you're absolutely right now one of the other scenes i liked and i kind of laughed at it was when the the neighbor kids or whatever dressed up as the aliens they were in that barn i mean everybody else in the theater was thinking that was the actual aliens until they took the mask off i could i heard the people around us i don't know if mark did but the people in front of us were like they're the aliens there they are they've already showed them and then they took the mask off and it was the kids yeah i was saying i was <sighs> saying that i was like i wonder if that's a prank because they stole his horse so I, I didn't even consider it to be like a prank like that never actually ever registered in my mind. And like the way that that shot is set up is like when that when they drop down and like it's like right behind him, like it got me. And like his, just his reaction to like punch it like I, I was like cheering. I was like, yes, <laughs> like I, I'm, I'm here for this. Yeah, that's that's 100 percent the reaction too. that's what. That's what I loved about this movie. It's like the reactions almost are real. Like what you would do if if somebody's dropping down on you, you're going to swing. You're not going to just stand there and look at them. Uh, I, yeah. I, I got a kick out of the fact that I, I have heard comedians and running jokes for years. Speaking, talk, talk speaking about- of run, run, OJ, run. <laughs> so, so i was really hoping i could resist it was there I, so i, I was it. really hoping the way the commercial for that movie was cut i really wish that was in the movie it would have made it so epic but the way they cut it in the commercial you see her scream and run oj run and a white horse which could have yeah. been a Bronco, Bronco is hauling ass down through the field. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. He did not make that reference. And I got let down. OJ is okay. like the main character of the movie. But when when they uh, said that reference, it didn't matter who you was in the theater. <laughs> everybody, I could hear everybody laughing. I mean, everybody. So, I mean, just the fact that we're throwing references to make you laugh and everything. 
Well, uh, what, what I got a kick out of was you've heard comedians and jokes for years and references to a lot of horror movies that the minorities are typically killed first and uh, white people are always trying to go to haunted houses and stuff like that and that the black people would be like, nope, not going to do it. And he pulls up and he realizes in the middle of the night that the UFO is over top of him and he starts to look out the window and he's just like, nope, 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 yeah. nope, mm-mm, nope. And it was so funny. The whole theater busted out laughing. And and, yeah. you, and you're talking about the white people going into the house and all. That's basically what the other yeah. sideshow was. That was the haunted house. They were sitting yeah. at the haunted house for the alien to come grab them and eat them up. So I want to get into a theory that I had for a while that I was let down by. So full disclosure, I didn't watch any trailers. I didn't see any any marketing campaigns for this outside of posters. So when this movie opens up on the birthday party scene with Gordy and the monkey, like we were I, confused. I was so confused. So like okay. first, first off, I was confused. But my theory was is that like when they because like uh, the way that the film set up is like they would have these like title cards that would be like the names of horses. So you had one for uh, Jean Jacket, you had one for Ghost, uh, and Ghost and Lucky. So like every time that there was like a, a horse involved, like you had a a card for it. So when Gordy had it, my I, I'm curious if you guys felt this way too. My entire thing was is that the aliens. And like Gordy were like in cahoots or like it, like Gordy was an alien in some way because like his entire like if you took out that plot line, it would be exactly the same. Right. So like my thing was is like, what is the significance of Gordy in this movie? Like, is it supposed to be like a representation of something? Um, it's the so, one thing that I'm like really and, like clueless about. See, so, I would. I was confused too. Sorry, Mark, but I was confused too. Um, one of the things I was seeing on there with Gordy had nothing to do with the storyline, but a lot of it looked like PTSD to me when they started bringing out the balloons and they're popping and everything and his reaction to everything. That's almost like a PTSD, like a dog with fireworks or a veteran with the fireworks where all of a sudden sure. it snapped to where, you know, Gordy was in another place, but I don't know how it links back to, the uh, storyline, and I'm glad you brought it up because I was going to ask, what did I miss? So at first, when they first show the opening scenes with Gordy, I thought it was going to be a reference to Monkey Paul Studios, just like a little clip like Bad Robot does and stuff like that. That's what I thought it was at first. But once they got into the movie and you figure out what the UFO actually is, what it's a reference to is that some of these animals, trained or not, are unpredictable at best. You can have a pet dog all you want and train him as good as you want, but there's always going to be an underlying unknown that may set that animal off. And that's what happened with Gordy. The, um, the balloons set him off. And with the quote unquote UFO, they were treating it as trying to break a wild horse once they figured out that it's actually animal hunting. So it was in reference to trying to train animals and the unpredictability that they can bring with them. So let me let me back up just a little bit and kind of kind of lean into a little bit of what you're saying, a little bit of what Billy's saying, and kind of like you have this like post traumatic stress disorder, and you guys are both talking about how like tr- trauma can be like triggered. There's a great scene in the office of Jupe where he's kind of like remembering the flashbacks, and like we get like bits and pieces of like his. Uh, like final day of like on the set of Gordy's home and there's like it's right before the big like Friday show that they're doing that's like summoning the alien craft and he kind of like just like flashes back out of it and his wife just kind of goes you know you're all right you ready kind of doing this and it's really interesting because like 
one of the things that like it's not even just aliens, Mark. I would or not not just pets, uh, but I would also say that like you know there's a underlining layer of that for people as well, where like I think sometimes that there are these like expectations that uh, society sets up for us or uh, employ employers set up for us as well, and we're expected to meet these. And if we don't, we're labeled a failure. We're labeled uh, less than. We're like looked down upon and really demeans uh, our, our value as humans, which in turn allows that individual to have a diluted. Uh, self-image of themselves that is leaning into those societal stereotypes versus to under versus um, you know understanding the limits of what they know we can they can take like we talked about with infrared like understanding like your own like mental health uh, what you can take and what you can't and like what is going to be beneficial versus what's going to be toxic If you or someone you know is listening to this podcast right now and you're struggling with suicide, addiction, self-harm, or depression, we encourage you guys to please reach out. This is the heartbeat of why we do what we do. Suicide is currently the 10th leading cause of death in the United States. And as of this recording, there are 132 suicides that take place each and every day on American soil. And when you scale back internationally, there are 800,000 successful suicides. That is one death roughly every 40 seconds. So if you or someone you know is struggling, you guys can go to victimsandvillains.net forward slash hope. That resource is going to be right in the description wherever you guys are currently listening or streaming this. There you'll find resources that include the National Suicide Lifeline, which is 1-800-273-8255. You can also text HELP to 741-741. We also have a plethora of other resources, including churches, getting connected with counselors, LGBT resources like the Trevor Project, and also Veteran Hotline as well. Please, if you hear nothing else in the show, understand that you, yes, you listening to this right now, have value and worth. We get it. Suicide, depression, mental health, these are hard topics, and the stigma around them doesn't make it any easier. But please consider the resources right in the descriptions below, wherever you guys are listening, because, once again, you have value and you have worth. So please, stay with us. No, I agree 100%. I mean... It's like society now, if you don't push through and do what you got to do, like you just said, people frown upon you and say, look, you're not up to standard. You're not doing what you're supposed to do. Whereas sometimes there are underlying reasons why you can't get it done uh, and you may need help or something and you're afraid to ask. I mean, at this, I'm going to say what we always say. um, Don't be afraid to ask for help. That's what I've taught my kids. That's what I've taught my boys. If, if you can't do something or you need help with something, it doesn't matter if it's actual job or something or if it's something you need to talk about, talk about it, get help, do what you got to do. Because if you keep pushing it down, it's just going to get worse. It's And it's too, it's really interesting to see how Jupe kind of handles this trauma throughout the entire course of the film because when... Uh, Daniel and Kiki's characters both go into like actually kind of like settle business. And he's kind of like showing off all of this, uh, this like memorabilia of Gordy's home. You kind of get to see it's like, all right. uh, He's clearly like really likes to breathe into this like whole stardom thing. But at the end of the day, like you can understand that like, it, so like that scene is like really interesting to ju- to juxtapose against the uh, scene where he's kind of having the flashback before the show. It's almost like he's overcompensating for the to overcome the fear that he went through. It, when exactly. He with the monkey. Exactly. Monkey. I, I think I think, too, you look at a, you look at someone like Robin Williams, where, uh, you know, if I don't know how much you guys know about Robin Williams and kind of like his like struggle with depression and always kind of like trying to like meet those expectations to where like 
I, I think it wasn't until like he was almost in the business for like, uh, you know, he really uh, hesitated about doing uh, Dead Poet Society because he's like, you know, it goes against literally everything that I've established up to myself right now up to this point um you know and he was just, he was kind of scared about how people were going to react to him he did the same thing with uh goodwill hunting ended up winning him an oscar and then you know he gets into like other roles like one hour photo and uh but one of the things that uh robin's wish was was a, a documentary we covered on victims and villains probably two years ago and the entirety of that is kind of like there's a there's a section of that documentary where it's interviewing uh, people that were close to Rob Williams. And he was like, he really confided in friends saying, you know, I don't know if I can always be on because like, uh, or people always expect him to be on. And like, it really kind of like messed with his identity towards the end of his, his life. Well, a lot of those, when you look into them, a lot of the best comedians ended up having like severe depression issues. Robin Williams was one of them, um, which was it James Belushi that ended up dying from drug issues. Um, yeah, Jim Belushi. Yeah, Jim Belushi. Um, Chris Farley. Chris Farley was the other one I was thinking of. Um, well, that's because like we as a, I feel like we as a as a culture, like we look at comedians and we have this like expectation that's all automatically already set for them like this is what they can be and if i meet them in person then they got to be like you know genuine there's a there was a video that went around a couple months ago of tom hanks and his wife coming back home from an airport to the hotel and like people were like you know expecting him to be like friendly because he's quote unquote america's dad and, you know, you expect him to be really g- genuine and sweet. And he ended up, uh, someone like ended up like, because of the, the mob of paparazzi around him, they ended up tripping his wife and he ended up like pushing up against his, uh, bodyguards and was like, everyone back the F up. Like, and I mean, I cussed out every single one of these guys and like, I mean, the video is like really just it's yeah. jaw dropping because you don't expect it from someone like Tom Hanks. Well, but also it, again, at the end of the day, he's still human. Like we, we can't. Yeah. Go ahead. Mark. But, but then you have where he was over here in Norfolk taping a movie a few years ago and went into one of the local diners and a dude was passed out on a table and his buddies were all hanging out and he had passed out drunk, I guess. And Tom Hanks went over, and was like taking pictures with him for fun with his buddies all around the tri- uh, the passed out guy who missed Tom Hanks because he was out cold. So, it, but yeah, it goes back to he's he's just even though he's famous for years for decades, he's still just another person. Right. You just got to remember that the actors are still a human. They've, for instance, if you were put in that situation, say Mark, and they were starting to mess with Kate, you'd do the same thing. You would be telling the crowd back the hell up. Uh, I need no. You're you're going to protect your family. But I mean, and, I'm I, I'm generally an asshole anyway. So oh, oh. <laughs> so so you're saying you're always on. I got it. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> but I was using that as an example. I mean, you got to remember at the end of the day, everybody's human, and you've got to treat them with human decency, not just the oh my God, this is a famous actor that I've always wanted to meet. And you've got to be hilarious because you're hilarious when I see you on TV. Which goes back to the movie in one of the opening scenes where, was it, what was his character's name? OJ was on on the set with the Oh yeah, Uh, yeah. And he was kind of overwhelmed by the crew and the experience and nobody was really listening to him. But the sister showed up with the yeah. attitude and the ability to handle it and they treated her completely different than they did him right and it was just a difference in the personalities is all it was and the other thing yeah. was they were asking a couple of them asked for the dad because he they didn't know the yeah. dad had passed away and apparently just based on that comment the dad used to handle that and do everything that everybody around them expected and just did it the way that they wanted it where yeah. OJ was putting his foot down, you can't do this, you can't do that. 
trying to protect the horse. But he was also kind of in uh, oh no, he was what unfamiliar territory. No, him. he was overwhelmed. You could yeah. the whole scene sets it up that he's overwhelmed. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's uh I, I, I just but like before we get like into like the other characters of this movie while we're still on the subject of Gordy, the one thing that like held me on to this like conspiracy theory about Gordy and the aliens being connected. What is the deal with that shoe? Like the the movie focuses on it so much, and even when you emerald, like he's taking emerald through like that like little weird museum room he's got. How the hell the is shoe it standing is, up? Is still is still standing up? Yeah, I, I I didn't get that either. I mean, the only other thing I could think of because in the scene with the um when they're on set, if I remember right, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's like the lights go out. Is it that the aliens were up above it and caused the power to go out like they're doing at the ranch and then they moved away and Gordy was set off because the aliens or was it because of the balloons? Did it happen to be the balloon setting it off? I think it was just the balloon set them off. I mean, it's like you've seen some dogs are okay yeah. during fireworks, but others like mine hits the deck and starts well, trying to crawl back in the house if you the, try to take him outside on the, the only seat. reason why i have that question is like josh is saying the shoe I, what made the shoe stand up I the aliens it was i'm not saying it was aliens but it was aliens the so, aliens made the shoe stand <laughs> up <laughs> so you're seeing this uh, the scene from a kid's point of view Shh, quit talking about me like that which me it, it could have <laughs> what's your been, point ha- it's yep. just how he's remembering it well wait a minute i would agree with that if it because wasn't no- in his place at the ranch where they all walk through the thing to look at all the memorabilia and the shoe was standing up and if you look at it it didn't look like anything was holding that thing up it was just standing there yeah I, so yeah in building some of these miniatures that i do you can make some of them look like they're floating above their stand okay. without it even looking like there's a connection if you know how to do your pins and stuff. All right. So it's very easy. Take your this. miniature aspect for, out of this. Take the miniature art. out. It, it would be very easy for him to do that on the display, but he's remembering the shoe as he sees it on a daily basis when he's remembering the scene from 20 years earlier. Okay. All right. All right. So let's say let, you're in you're in two seasons of this TV show. You're a kid, you know, kids, memories all the time. Right. Whatever. Science will prove that it's it's lofty. It's fine. It is what it is. But why for this like particular traumatic episode was you remember a single shoe, not not a pair of shoes, but a single shoe upright? And the single shoe was separate. It wasn't on the lady that was wearing the shoe. It was over off to the side beside her. So, I mean, I would see if the shoe was near her. You remember, you remember both shoes being on her and it being upright. Or like he's saying, both shoes standing up. Why a single shoe? I mean, that's how he's got it displayed. All right. So why is it not <laughs> possible that he's just remembering the scene? I think so, I got it. But I, think I, I don't think so, I think you're reading way too much into that. I think I think it goes back to just talking uh, like they even made a reference to uh Siegfried and Roy and the Tigers. So I, I think it goes back to um just even trained animals are unpredictable. I I think I got it. All right. So the the idea of you know, because we as we as humans we can we can withstand a lot and our brains depending on like which side of psychology you try to read can say that you know both repressed memories are but aren't a thing and so like if you lean into the side where they say they are a thing repressed memories are constantly like a uh it's your brain fending off and trying to essentially my understanding is like trying to like fend you off from kind of going down and protecting you essentially. So if Jupe has this singular memory, the shoe could actually be like almost like a personification of that memory. Like just, just, just the fact that like 
this is the one secret that he has and the shoe is kind of supposed to like be like a representation of that i don't know or maybe just maybe you're thinking real too hard into well, it and I, you're trying to find meaning where there may not be any i know what mark is trying to say he's <laughs> what what mark is saying is you were saying repressed memory uh, memories and everything and what mark is trying to say he's remembering you know the old stuff and the pieces that he doesn't remember he's filling in and because he sees the shoe every day standing up is standing up in his memory that's that's basically what mark's saying right yeah. mark I yeah, you're just reading too much into it, trying to find a deep. Mark's look, just, Mark's just too simple. He can't see what's happening. Look, I, the I simplest think explanation is usually the most correct. Not when you have filmmakers like like Peel, like like Jordan Peel has uh, as kind of this like when you look at Get Out, like Get Out is essentially like okay, like this is a social commentary on racism and and classism, like that's. That's like pretty straightforward. But when you get into movies like Us and Nope, there is like the reason that makes them they make they're so good is because it's so much I feel like better than Get Out is because it's not necessarily uh, like straight black and white. Like well, there's so much that you can it, read into it and interpret it. Us, us was a um, reference to marginalized people. That's what Us was. And marginalized that's, communities. That's fine. Yeah. But also at the same time, like there's there's so much nuance to that movie that like the the marginalization of uh, people groups might be like the main point that he's like getting at to the end, but you still have to build the bridge to get there. Uh, I read a lot of it. I read a lot of interviews with him. Yeah, I read a lot of interviews with him, and like he talked about like specifically like there are things in the background that he placed there to specifically drive that point forward. And I feel like, I feel like Nope does a lot of the same things to where it's like, it's an entertaining movie on the surface, but once you kind of start reading a little bit more into it and the social commentary of what he is trying to essentially establish with the narrative, there's a lot more to the surface than just what we see in the, on the eye. I know some of the early things I saw about it were saying you'd either love the movie or hate the movie. And I think part of that came from the fact that it appeared to be a alien flick when it's actually a creature feature. I think that's part of why it was a love it or hate it. But I don't feel like it had the level of social commentary the Get Out or Us or even Candyman had. I think it I think it does. I think it's just better hidden. And the reason that I would would make this com- this com- uh, this comparison is because it feels like some of David Lynch's latter work where you look at something like Mahalan Drive or Inlet Empire or even Lost Highway and all of these movies and like even like elements of Twin Peaks the returns, like on the surface, like it's a straightforward thriller or drama or whatever genre you want to say but there's so much underneath the surface that he's trying to say trying to address and that's kind of how i feel about the way that nope is is that nope feels really big in scope it's very much a blockbuster it very much is a throwback like what we've been saying but there's a lot more that i i feel like he's also addressing while making said blockbuster I'm not sure I caught what he was addressing in this one then. Oh, I, I, like I said, I'm right there with you guys. Uh, I, I haven't, I feel like I haven't had time to adequately like digest all of this movie uh, because the, I feel like the first time you get, you see this movie, you just get so wrapped up in its beauty and it's, it's humor and it's, uh, it's, it's, its characters and uh also at the same time i feel like with that also you just kind of get overtaken by just the scope of this movie yeah i mean it feels like a very well balanced movie overall well it's not too much of one thing or anything like that it just it felt well balanced between suspense and 
effect and builds and and comedy and everything it just it was very well balanced and well done well one of the comments i made to mark was i mean not a hundred percent but it kind of gave me a science feel a little bit of m night Shyamalan, where it's look over here look over there we're not going to show it to you and everything and then at the end boom here's the alien i mean it showed the ship and everything but it didn't show the everything until the very end and it showed it to you so i mean and i actually liked that movie when it came out so it 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 did give that hey we're going to show you over here we're going to show you over there but the aliens, the aliens yeah. that are allergic yeah. to water coming yeah to yeah yeah it's like exactly 90 water yeah yeah exactly how did you guys feel about the fact that like this is like a, a the the notion that this is an alien movie but it's like i i've never seen an alien movie done like this with like the cloud and the spaceship and the form but also at the same time, like just kind of being like ruthless. That's because uh, it's advertised as an alien movie, but it's a creature feature. And the creature is acting like a predator, something like a tiger or a leopard or a jaguar or something like that. If you pay attention to the way it's kind of sneaking back and forth through the clouds, stalking its prey almost when it comes out to get the horses or anything like that it 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 even does the in the in the scene where he's after it's already like eating everybody in the theme park oh yeah he goes in it even does almost a um ambush attack on him trying to get him as he runs into cover so Mm. it's actually moving if you really pay attention to it it's actually moving almost almost like a, a wild cat and and i can get to i can get the creature feature because like yeah. you just brought up when it actually ate the people and everything and it showed the inside of the ship and it was more like a digestive system than than aliens inside a ship yeah so it's a, it's a creature so feature it's it, really it like is film. more like a creature versus an alien it, like I, I talked about this uh, now that you guys are talking about it, like I talked about it in my my spoiler free review about like how this movie kind of reminded me a lot of like Close Encounters of the Third Kind or like 70s movies that dealt with aliens and stuff like that. But like now that you guys are talking about it, like this movie kind of almost has a, a, a blob quality to it kind where of. it's 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 it has that like drive in feel to it but like the monster aspect of it is it is a creature feature it's like something that you would kind of see on the b-movie circuits it's it's almost like if somebody took ghosts in the darkness and crossed it with the blob have y'all seen ghost in the darkness (laughs) i've never even heard of ghost in the darkness i've heard of it (laughs) so it's a movie based on actual events in africa where a lion started hunting people. Um, Ooh, wow, that yeah. sounds like the preview of the other movie we saw. <laughs> so, yeah, was it Beast they keep advertising? With, yeah, uh, that's yeah. why I made that comment. Um, no, it's, <laughs> it's actually based on real events. They're building, like, I, I think they're building, like, a train line through a portion of Africa, and all the the crew starts getting hunted, and, like, taken out by a wild lion or two and it turns out i think science ended up to scientists ended up determining it had like um an abscess tooth or something so it was eating people because it was softer and easier to eat <laughs> but ghost in the darkness it was um so it's like mark michael when he douglas. gets upset i think it was michael douglas and val kilmer or something like that i know val kilmer was in it yeah Yep. So it's like Ghost in the Dark is crossed with the blob almost. Interesting. Yeah, I, I, I like I you you believe it's like it is an alien movie until the last act where it kind of reaches its like final form. And I got to say, like, I really admired like the visual effects or like at least like the aesthetic of how it kind of would come to its prey um because you would get those like 
uh, almost like kite like uh, reflexes where it would kind of right. be like folding into itself and then it would kind of be like still evolving. And it reminded me of what are those like lizards that have like the the little sides that come out like the, the spiky when they're getting ready to attack their prey. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I know what you're talking about. No, it it actually reminded me of um, Angels from the Ava series. I could see that. It, uh, it again, Josh is clueless. You've never seen Ava, have you? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty well, sure Danny might smack you. Th- um, this is the benefit of being around Mark. <laughs> so it's so Neon Genesis Evangelion is like considered one of the most influential anime series ever. And I don't there- watch anime, but I know what you're talking about. Well, the there were like aliens or whatever and it, creatures in it that were called angels. And that is what that thing reminded me of when it unfolded for the final act of the movie. That is exactly what it looked like may have influenced the designs of that thing was one of the angels from that series. Interesting. Okay. Uh, speaking of aliens, we got to talk about the... Uh... The, the one scene where uh, the the craft is just kind of flying above uh, Emerald and OJ's ranch house and blood just blood. comes down. Yeah. Probably my favorite scene in the entire movie. Yeah, that was what I was referring to earlier when he's in his truck and he's just like, nope, nope, nope. Not going out. Oh. <laughs> not doing oh, not it. Even, not even then. Earlier, when when the dad was on the horse and he was walking away. I mean, just that scene at the at the beginning was like, what the hell? I mean, and he goes and finds a house key in the back of the horse. And it was like a nickel the Turk it took out his dad. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. And it, it just it was ridiculous. I just want to know what it ate to give him indigestion at that point. I'm game for video, it. I thought your video froze. <laughs> no, 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 no. I yeah, I yeah i'm game for it um yeah i I don't know uh i i think it's really interesting to the uh you know kind of to dig back into the the mental health and some of the social commentaries that this movie may or may not be portraying um but uh oj is uh the scene where they're at the diner and uh he is kind of like recounting about like how you never look a horse in the eye and believes the same thing that if you don't look the alien in the eye, like you'll live right. essentially. Uh, I read somewhere like someone's like review uh, saying that like, it's supposed to be like signaling, like kind of how we <sighs> silence is violence kind of thing. Um, I don't know. Do you guys, kind of, what do you guys Kind of going to where if you don't look them in the eye, they're not going to come talk to me. They're not going to come mess with me, things like that. It's kind of the feel I got of with the alien. It's like if I don't look at it and it doesn't look at me, it's going to leave me alone. Uh, So it's really hard because like when you look at when you see the alien, when you see the spacecraft, it is a it is a every bit a spectacle. Yeah. And when you look and you recount like what we've seen the last two years with police brutality racism um even more recently as like the the whole like roe v versus way thing the january 6th uh uh storming of the white house uh everything like that like there is like so much that you know has been kind of like spectacles that we've seen on political terms and to some people and i i think people might you know this is something he might be saying is like you know I think sometimes it's a lot easier to just kind of ignore a lot of that stuff, but in the end, the the those effects are still going to be a, uh, felt whether you address them or not. How would you guys like to help us get mental health resources into schools, conventions, and other events? Well, now you can. Simply go to patreon.com forward slash victims and villains for as little as $1 a month. You guys can help us get mental health resources into current and upcoming generations, educate and break down stigma surrounding mental health, suicide, and depression. 
and you get exclusive content that you can't get anywhere else. And you guys can tell us which Nicolas Cage movie you want us to cover, and we'll do it. All it takes to get started is to go to patreon.com forward slash victims and villains, or simply click the link in the episode description wherever you guys are currently listening or streaming this episode. Pick your tier and get started today. Yes, it's that simple. So quickly select the tier that you want and help us get hope into the hands of the depressed and the suicidal today. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with you 100%. It's where if, if I don't pay attention to this, it's gonna, not going to affect me. But in the long run, it is. It doesn't matter who you are, your background or anything. All, everything that's going on is going to eventually come back and affect you in some way, shape or form. Is that all you got, Mark? <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know on that one. Politics are, are, are a hard thing to address, and, and I have tried to not only in abyss gazing, but also in victims and villains and any of the content we create across the board to address politics as little as possible because of how divisive they are. Yeah. And, uh, you know, but across the, the board with that thing, you know, when the whole the murder of George Floyd happened in 2020, you know, that really affected me like uh uh, on an an emotional level like talking with a lot of uh black friends that i had you know it was like okay what do we want to what how how do we as someone that's speaking out against mental health with these events that are clearly going on that are affecting mental health and self-image of how an entire race sees themselves in culture how do we go about and actually address you know, address these without seeming too political or seeming like we lean to one side or the other. And, uh, you know, that's kind of where the, the black lives matters, um, and a culture of diversity, diversity series were, were birthed, um, and stuff like that. And I don't know, it's, it's always been something that I, I don't like necessarily addressing things with politics, but I understand that there's a lot of things that we've seen in the last couple of years about politics or political decisions that are now affecting entire uh, genders with, with women and, uh, you know, the whole Roe v. versus Wade being overturned and uh, their mental health, but also everything we've seen in the last couple of years with um, Black people in particular uh, with the, you know, living with pro- police brutality and racism still being very much alive in our culture all of that stuff affects your mental health it is it is also a creator of uh depression suicidal tendencies hatred etc at the same time though you have to look at what's being told do your research and determine what's fact from fiction or fact from narrative Absolutely. That's one of the things that I, I learned in, in doing the Black Lives Matter series. I, I would, I, there were several hours that Colesta and I talked about where it would be like, I was taught this in, in school and then sitting down and actually like reading and like doing the research and listening to podcasts and uh, watching documentaries on these subjects. You're like, this is kind of the, the squeaky clean image that we have portraying and we are teaching to generations. This is the dirty facts of actually what really happened. You also, I mean, it's, it's a tough subject to tackle. So any of them are, because when you look at the sources the sources are still telling things from their point of view. So you almost have to find sources from both sides and go down the middle to find what the actual facts are. Yeah, you're not and you're not wrong. And like I, I I've mentioned like women and the you know African American race specifically. Um, and we're all three cis white dudes talking about this so it's like i i don't feel like qualified to talk about it but at the end of the day it's like all of this stuff all of these events they affect your your mental health and by kind of embracing that ignorance and not actually looking at it doing the research like 
it's going to eventually come back to haunt you and it comes down to just do your research. Yeah, I agree a hundred percent. And like you said, and like you said, we're three white dudes sitting here talking about it. Whereas we don't live it every day or we don't, you know, experience it every day. And we definitely would need to do our research to know exactly, you know, the actual facts. You can't go based on what's put in front of you, um, be it Facebook or news or something like that. You need to go do the research, like you're saying, to see what is actually going on, what's actually happening. And and you have to be willing to actually listen to, to things outside of your own viewpoint. If you don't or you can't, then you're not going to be able to move forward or learn anything. Please, let me just emphasize that. Like, listening goes so far. And whether it is someone just needing to vent about current of offense or someone that is actually going through a, a mental health crisis and just wants to be heard, like, listening just listening and opening up your mind just goes such a long way. Uh, Mark, I, I know you're not the, the hugest fan of, of these guys, but um, probably one of my favorite lyrics from motionless and white is open your mind before your mouth. And that was on their very first album. And I listened to that when I was a, a, a little seeny weenie and like, I still come back to that line because like it is kind of shaped how I approach relationships with people and how I hear people out because at the end of the day, listening goes so much further. And there's different types of listening. There's listening to listen. And then you have people that are listening to think of what they're going to say next and how they're going to respond or how they're going to object and things like that. And Motionless and White was very impressive live. Thank you very much. I, I told did, you. <laughs> I, I had just, I had never seen them or, or heard them much. So that's really all I was. I didn't really know much about them. I'm more on the death core side of things and melodic death and symphonic. I, death. I am well aware, Mark. <laughs> I, I'm actually wearing my motionless and white t-shirt right now. So <laughs> that's a bit of ironic. Um, but yeah, that's, that, that's the difference is if you're listening to listen, it's easier to put essentially put two and two together than when you're listening and trying to think of what to say next and trying to think of your response. Yeah. Yeah, I, I want to uh, jump back into aliens real quick. Yeah, uh, and, and kind of ask you guys, how do you guys felt about like the the pacing of the reveal of the aliens? Because I feel like I feel like nowadays, like we are so it was spoiled. A creature, creature. Okay, Mark. <laughs> All right, I will use the term creature. Uh, I feel like we're so spoiled by like comic book movies now, and he's like tentpole blockbusters that like we need to have this like over abundance of like seeing the villain or the thing that the heroes are rallying to fight against and this movie like not it feels like less it feels nostalgic because it's embracing that idea of you can get away with doing much more effective uh storytelling without actually showing it and like building your story around like the presumed villain. I I still think it builds off of what I was saying earlier, like with Gordy and the reference, they made a comment about um, Siegfried and Roy and pretty much everybody knows what happened there with their tigers. And I think it was a play off that and dealing with animals. It, it really felt like because when you hear about encounters in the wild with some of these wild creatures, uh, wild animals, um, more specifically some of the wild cats, you might hear them, you might see little signs that they're there, but then it slowly starts to build until they're pouncing. And that's what the pacing of the movie (laughs) reminded me of, is hearing about some of these encounters in the wild with like wild cats specifically. 
are you saying like kind of like going back to like what we were talking about uh like a few months ago with fire in the sky and travis walton's story uh about like how you know i feel like to go off your what you're saying like I, 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 us at the as humans like we feel like we're at the top of the food chain when really we are just the prey for another species is that what you're kind of saying we're so humans are like one of the, pretty much the only species that require the uh, an um a weapon or something to defend themselves against a wild animal so Don't. if you ran into a bear out in the woods in the mountains what are you going to do to it but technically doesn't the bear have a weapon it's got its claws and i mean it's got its the bear is a bear but what i'm what is it equipped with but uh, uh, no no i you (laughs) just completely understood what i was saying because what i was saying is like we as humans we hunt the food chain because we and our hierarchy hierarchy are over top of the animal kingdom yeah but when you look at the universe as a whole we are the prey to whatever else is out there right like we could be that's yeah yeah, but that's that's what it feels like nope does yeah i mean we could be the prey to some of the animals that are in zoos if we are in a different aspect of verse and in yeah exactly environment to where right now we're in our houses and we're going to visit them at the zoo if we're in their environment where they're known and everything we're the prey and they're they're coming after us and that's what to me this movie shows is depending on the environment and the setup is who is to pray and who's going to be the one getting eat, uh, who's getting eaten and who's going to be dominating over it. I, I, Josh, Josh still seems like he feels like this is an alien. It's an alien. <laughs> it is an alien. At this, at this point, I'm just kind of doing it to like dig underneath your skin. <laughs> well, I mean, I like to do that from time to time. If you don't know what it is, it's an alien. Technically, Billy is not wrong. And and I mean, in the movie, I forget what I forget what they said. Uh, I know it's a new term. That's like they were correcting each other. It's no longer a UFO. It's what was it? A UPA UAP UAP. I was like, it's the same concept, Mark. You can call it what you want to call it, but it's still the same thing. You don't know what it is. I want it. It's kind of interesting because I'm. What is UAP? Thank you. Unidentified oh, aerial, aerial phenomena. Okay. Thank you, because that's what I was going to do, Josh. I was getting ready to look it up. <laughs> I was sitting there thinking, it's like you know, it could mean something like unidentified apex predator. And then just the exactly. predator comes back. Would you <laughs> notice how Mark had to just slip that in? What? Look. He, how Look, am I, I, I prom- one that saw animal references through the whole movie with everything? I, I promise you Prey is coming. Because like anytime that I see a movie initially, I just watch it for a movie. I just watch it for a movie's sake, and then I let it wash over me yeah. and what it's saying. And then you watch it 32 times in the theater because you've got one of those regal passes. It can't. <laughs> Hell Yeah. <laughs> As my dog sits here and looks at me like I'm a dumbass. He's not wrong. <laughs> it's irrelevant. <laughs> I I I understand like where you're coming from with like the ale with the, the animal references. But like to to uh to Billy's point, like it under also an under it, it's your environment. And so like here you have a like Jupe's a great example of that. Like Jupe is like draws this like big spectacle around the U the UAP coming down, and he thinks it's like, oh hey, like I'm bringing this animal to sacrifice it and to give you all a show, and that really backfires against him exactly. because at the end of the day, like it would try it would it would basically be like the equivalent of taking like a tiger or a cheetah and trying to kind of do the same thing for spectacle like you're literally putting yourself out there like i think it's fascinating in this movie that uh 
uh, Jute talks about how like he's had these encounters, but they've all been peaceful up to this moment. And it's like, dude, now you're exploiting it for your own game. Like you've kind of like upset the established order. It, it's almost like he back to he's trying to overcompensate for what happened with the chimp. Yeah, I mean, especially with uh, I forget be, the character's name that she, he had there, but his co-star that you know that was hurt by the chimp, he even had her there as part of the spectacle. Yeah, like like he's trying to make up for his lack of control and ability with the chimp on set. He's going to control this big giant no. thing. No, I, I, yeah, that, I, I hate I to admit it. Forces. I hate to admit it, though, but on that scene that we're talking about, when the uh, alien leaves and it comes back and you can still hear the mic going, I actually enjoyed the fact that they left that uh, to where, hey, look, when it comes back, you can still hear all the people screaming that it just ate. Well, even when he took out some horses, you could hear the horses almost screaming. Right. So that was the sound of this creature was whatever it was digesting, essentially screaming. That was its sound. It's I would imagine it's got to be like the equivalent of like being buried alive. Uh, exactly. The way that it consumed you like it's kind of it's super terrifying. And that's the way I took it too. Is it like being buried alive? And he still had the mic on his head. I, I get what Mark's saying that it heard the horses and all, but it was almost like a mic feedback when it came down, even though there wasn't power when it came down really quick that there was power. You could hear the mic feedback and like Jude screaming and everything else. And that kind of gave a little bit more to me that there, he's the alien still digesting them when he's coming after OJ. I don't know. Alien. I was, Alien. <laughs> you guys are dicks. <laughs> I I just thought it was a fun movie overall. Oh, I I agree a hundred percent. I I mean I'll go, I'd go back and watch the movie. I'm kind of like Josh said at the beginning. I'm kind of dreading watching it on TV, on a DVD or HBO or whatever, because so, I don't think it's going to give the same effect as that IMAX. Well, I know Josh already has tickets to see it again and watch try to find uh ghost of the darkness and watch it before you go i can't i i literally have i literally have no time that just means i gotta go back and see it a third time darn it (laughs) or or look up stories and interactions with wild cats before you go see it that's how this thing acts is like a, a a wild uh, more of a wild cat than a bear. A bear is almost like running into a tank. So <laughs> they're just straightforward. Um, but cats don't. They stalk, they hide, they're in and out of bushes, tracking you down. Okay. I live with two cats, Mark, so I understand. I have a strange fascination with the felines. Uh, But uh, I think it's going to do it for us wrapping up on Nope. I promise this is probably not the last time you'll hear about this movie. We'll probably do a... Coles and I will probably do something with it when it comes back out on Blu-ray. But, Mark, my friend, where can people find you online? I've actually been updating my Instagram recently. I'm so proud of you. (laughs) With some recent projects and stuff underway. Um, Titanium juggernaut painting on Instagram. Yeah. And Billy, where can people stalk you online? They can't stalk me yet. I'm like I said last time I need to get with Mark. I just haven't had time, but I'm going to definitely make a, make it to where I can give you something next time. I, I will post his home address in the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> he knows where I live. So, <laughs> so uh, anyways, you guys can find me. I'm on Captain. I'm Captain Nostalgia on uh, Letterbox. I am Gent, G-E-N-T, Ghostface on TikTok. And you guys can follow our parent company, Victims and Villains. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Twitch, YouTube, wherever you guys get your podcasts from and as well uh you guys can support us 
monthly via Patreon, patreon.com forward slash victims and villains, where you guys can get all of, uh, all of that in the show notes below, along with submitting your nightmares for our 2023 film festival, uh, horrific hope. All the details are in the show notes below. Thank you guys. Uh, for hanging out with us and talking about nope and remember the more that you gaze into the abyss the more the abyss gazes back into you